Chapter 51 The Glory of Trondheim Aragon jolted upright as a growl sounded in his ear. Sephira was still asleep, her eyes wandering sightlessly under her eyelids, and her upper lip trembled as if she were going to snarl. He smiled, then jerked as she growled again. She must be dreaming, he realised. He watched her for a minute, then carefully slid out from under her wing. He stood and stretched. The room was cool, but not unpleasantly so. Murtagh lay on his back in the far corner, his eyes closed. As Aragorn stepped around Sephira, Murtagh stirred. Morning, he said quietly, sitting up. How long have you been awake? asked Aragorn in a hushed voice. A while. I'm surprised Sophia didn't wake you sooner. I was tired enough to sleep through a thunderstorm, said Aragorn wryly. He sat by Murtagh and rested his head against the wall. Do you know what time it is? No, it's impossible to tell in here. Has anyone come in to see us? Not yet. They sat together without moving or speaking. Aragorn felt oddly bound to Murtagh. I've been carrying his father's sword, which would have been his... his inheritance. We're alike in many ways, yet our outlook and upbringing are totally different. He thought of Murtagh's scar and shivered. What man could do that to a child? Sephira lifted her head and blinked to clear her eyes. She sniffed the air, then yawned expansively, her rough tongue curling at the tip. Has anything happened? Aragorn shook his head. I hope they give me more food than that snack last night. I'm hungry enough to eat a herd of cows. They'll feed you, he assured her. They'd better. She positioned herself near the door and settled down to wait, tail flicking. Aragorn closed his eyes, enjoying the rest. He dozed a while, then got up and paced around. Bored, he examined one of the lanterns. It was made of a single piece of teardrop-shaped glass, about twice the size of a lemon, and filled with soft blue light that neither wavered nor flickered. Four slim metal ribs wrapped smoothly around the glass, meeting at the top to form a small hook, and again at the bottom, where they melded together into three graceful legs. The whole piece was quite attractive. Aragorn's inspection was interrupted by voices outside the room. The door opened, and a dozen warriors marched inside. The first man gulped when he saw Sephira. They were followed by Oric and the bald man, who declared, You have been summoned to Ajihad, leader of the Varden. If you must eat, do so while we march. Aragorn and Murtagh stood together, watching him warily. Where are our horses? And can I have my sword and bow back? asked Aragorn. The bold man looked at him with disdain. Your weapons will be returned to you when Ajihod sees fit, not before. As for your horses, they await you in the tunnel. Now come. As he turned to leave, Aragorn asked quickly, How is Arya? The bold man hesitated. I do not know. The healers are still with her. He exited the room, accompanied by Uruk. One of the warriors motioned. You go first. Aragorn went through the doorway, followed by Sephira and Murtagh. They returned through the corridor they had traversed the night before, passing the statue of the quilled animal. When they reached the huge tunnel through which they had first entered the mountain, the bold man was waiting with Oric, who held Tornach and Snowfire's reins. You will ride single file down the centre of the tunnel, instructed the bold man. If you attempt to go anywhere else, you will be stopped. When Aragorn started to climb onto Sephira, the bold man shouted, No! Ride your horse until I tell you otherwise. Aragorn shrugged and took Snowfire's reins. He swung into the saddle, guided Snowfire in front of Sephira, and told her, 
Stay close, in case I need your help. Of course, she said. Murtog mounted Tornak behind Safira. The bold man examined their small line, then gestured at the warriors, who divided in half to surround them, giving Safira as wide a berth as possible. Oric and the bold man went to the head of the procession. After looking them over once more, the bold man clapped twice and started walking forward. Aragorn tapped Snowfire lightly on his flanks. The entire group headed toward the heart of the mountain. Echoes filled the tunnel as the horses' hooves struck the hard floor, the sounds amplified in the deserted passageway. Doors and gates occasionally disturbed the smooth walls, but they were always closed. Aragorn marvelled at the sheer size of the tunnel, which had been mined with incredible skill. The walls, floor and ceiling were crafted with flawless precision. The angles at the bases of the walls were perfectly square, and as far as he could tell, the tunnel itself did not vary from its course by even an inch. As they proceeded, Aragorn's anticipation about mating Ajihod increased. The leader of the Varden was a shadowy figure to the people within the Empire. He had risen to power nearly twenty years ago, and since then had waged a fierce war against King Galbatorix. No one knew where he came from, or even what he looked like. It was rumoured that he was a master strategist, a brutal fighter. With such a reputation, Aragorn worried about how they would be received. Still, knowing that Brom had trusted the Varden enough to serve them, helped to allay his fears. Seeing Oric again had brought forth new questions in his mind. The tunnel was obviously dwarf work. No one else could mine with such skill. But were the dwarfs part of the Varden, or were they merely sheltering them? And who was the king that Oric had mentioned? Was it Ajihod? Aragorn understood now that, that the Varden had been able to escape discovery by hiding underground. But what about the elves? Where were they? For nearly an hour, the bold man led them through the tunnel, never straying nor turning. We've probably already gone a league, Aragorn realised. Maybe they're taking us all the way through the mountain. At last, a soft white glow became visible ahead of them. He strained his eyes, trying to discern its source, but it was still too far away to make out any details. The glow increased in strength as they neared it. Now... He could see thick marble pillars laced with rubies and amethysts standing in rows along the walls. Scores of lanterns hung between the pillars, suffusing the air with liquid brilliance. Gold tracery gleamed from the pillars' bases like molten thread. Arcing over the ceiling were carved raven heads, their beaks open in mid-screech. At the end of the hallway rested two colossal black doors, accented by shimmering silver lines that depicted a seven-pointed crown that spanned both sides. The bold man stopped and raised a hand. He turned to Aragorn. You will ride your dragon now. Do not attempt to fly away. There will be people watching, so remember who and what you are. Aragorn dismounted Snowfire and then clambered on to Sophia's back. I think they want to show us off she said, as he settled into the saddle. We'll see. I wish I had Zadok, he replied, tightening the straps around his legs. It might be better that you aren't wearing Morzan's sword when the Varden first see you. True. I'm ready, Aragorn said, squaring his shoulders. Good, said the bold man. He and Oric retreated to either side of Sephira, staying far enough back so she was clearly in the lead. Now, walk to the doors, and once they open, follow the path. Go slowly. Ready? asked Aragorn. Of course. Sephira approached the doors at a measured pace. Her scales sparkled in the light, sending glints of colour dancing over the pillars. Aragorn took a deep breath so to steady his nerves. Without warning, the doors swung outward on hidden joints. As the rift widened between them, rays of sunlight streamed into the tunnel, falling on Sephira and Aragorn. 
Temporarily blinded, Aragon blinked and squinted. When his eyes adjusted to the light, he gasped. They were inside a massive volcanic crater. Its walls narrowed to a small ragged opening so high above that Aragon could not judge the distance. It might have been more than a dozen miles. A soft beam of light fell through the aperture, illuminating the crater's centre, though it left the rest of the cavernous expanse in hushed twilight. The crater's far side, hazy blue in the distance, looked to be nearly ten miles away. Giant icicles, hundreds of feet thick and thousands of feet long, hung leagues above them like glistening daggers. Aragon knew from his experience in the valley that no one, not even Sephira, could reach those lofty points. Farther down the crater's inner walls, dark mats of moss and lichen covered the rock. He lowered his gaze and saw a wide, cobblestone path extending from the door's threshold. The path ran straight to the centre of the crater, where it ended at the base of a snowy white mountain that glittered like an uncut gem with thousands of coloured lights. It was less than a tenth of the height of the crater that loomed over and around it, but its diminutive appearance was deceiving, for it was slightly higher than a mile. Long as it was, the tunnel had only taken them through one side of the crater wall. As Aragorn stared, he heard Oryx say deeply, Look well, human, for no rider has set eyes upon this for nigh over a hundred years. The airy peak under which we stand is far and dear, discovered thousands of years ago by the father of our race, Gorgon, while he tunneled for gold. And in the centre stands our greatest achievement, Trondheim, the city mountain built from the purest marble. The doors grated to a halt. A city? Then, Aragorn saw the crowd. He had been so engrossed by the sights that he had failed to notice a dense sea of people clustered around the tunnel's entrance. They lined the cobblestone pathway. Dwarves and humans packed together like trees in a thicket. There were hundreds, thousands of them. Every eye, every face, was focused on Aragorn. And every one of them was silent. Aragorn gripped the base of one of Sephira's neck spikes. He saw children in dirty smocks, hardy men with scarred knuckles, women in homespun dresses, and stout, weathered dwarves who fingered their beards. All of them bore the same taut expression, that of an injured animal when a predator is nearby and escape is impossible. A bead of sweat rolled down Aragorn's face, but he dared not move to wipe it away. What should I do? he asked frantically. Smile, raise your hand, anything, replied Sephira sharply. Aragorn tried to force out a smile, but his lips only twitched. Gathering his courage, he pushed a hand into the air, jerking it in a little wave. When nothing happened, he flushed with embarrassment, lowered his arm, and ducked his head. A single cheer broke the silence. Someone clapped loudly. For a brief second, the crowd hesitated. Then a wild roar swept through it, and a wave of sound crashed over Aragorn. Very good, said the bold man from behind him. Now, start walking. Relieved, Aragorn sat straighter and playfully asked Sephira, Shall we go? She arched her neck and stepped forward. As they passed the first row of people, she glanced to each side and exhaled a puff of smoke. The crowd quieted and shrank back. Then, resumed cheering, their enthusiasm only intensified. Show off, chided Aragorn. Sephira flicked her tail and ignored him. He stared curiously at the jostling crowd as she proceeded down the path. Dwarves greatly outnumbered humans, and many of them glared at him resentfully. Some even turned their backs and walked away with stony faces. The humans were hard, tough people. All the men had daggers or knives at their waists, 
Many were armed for war. The women carried themselves proudly, but they seemed to conceal the deep abiding weariness. The few children and babies stared at Aragon with large eyes. He felt certain that these people had experienced much hardship and that they would do whatever was necessary to defend themselves. The Varden had found the perfect hiding place. Father Endure's walls were too high for a dragon to fly over, and no army could break through the entranceway, even if it managed to find the hidden doors. The crowd followed close behind them, giving Safira plenty of room. Gradually, the people quieted, though their attention remained on Aragon. He looked back and saw Murtagh riding stiffly, his face pale. They neared the city mountain, and Aragorn saw that the white marble of Trondheim was highly polished into flowing contours, as if it had been poured into place. It was dotted with countless round windows framed by elaborate carvings. A coloured lantern hung in each window, casting a soft glow on the surrounding rock. No turrets or smokestacks were visible. Directly ahead, two thirty-foot-high gold griffins guarded a massive timber gate, recessed twenty yards into the base of Trondheim, which was shadowed by thick trusses that supported an arched vault far overhead. When they reached Trondheim's base, Safira paused to see if the bald man had any instructions. When none were forthcoming, she continued to the gate. The walls were lined with fluted pillars of blood-red jasper. Between the pillars hold statues of outlandish creatures, captured forever by the sculptor's chisel. The heavy gate rumbled open before them as hidden chains slowly raised the mammoth beams. A four-story high passageway extended straight toward the centre of Trondheim. The top three levels were pierced by rows of archways that revealed grey tunnels curving off into the distance. Clumps of people filled the arches, eagerly watching Aragon and Sephira. On ground level, however, the archways were barred by stout doors. Rich tapestries hung between the different levels, embroidered with heroic figures and tumultuous battle scenes. A cheer rang in their ears as Sephira stepped into the hall and paraded down it. Aragon raised his hand, eliciting another roar from the throng, though many of the dwarfs did not join the welcoming shout. The mile-long hall ended in an arch flanked by black onyx pillars. Yellow zircons, three times the size of a man, capped the dark cons, coruscating piercing gold beams along the hall. Safira stepped through the opening, then stopped and craned back her neck, hubbing deeply in her chest. They were in a circular room, perhaps a thousand feet across, that reached up to Trondheim's peak a mile overhead, narrowing as it rose. The walls were lined with arches, one row for each level of the city mountain, and the floor was made of polished carnelian, upon which was etched a hammer girdled by twelve silver pentacles, like on Oryx's helm. The room was a nexus for four hallways, including the one they had just exited, that divided Trondheim into quarters. The halls were identical, except for the one opposite Aragon. To the right and left of that hall were tall arches that opened to descending stairs, which mirrored each other as they curved underground. The ceiling was capped by a dawn-red star sapphire of monstrous size. The jewel was twenty yards across and nearly as thick. Its face had been carved to resemble a rose in full bloom, and so skilled was the craftsmanship, the flower almost seemed to be real. A wide belt of lanterns wrapped around the edge of the sapphire, which cast striated bands of blushing light over everything below. The flashing rays of the star within the gem made it appear as if a giant eye gazed down at them. Aragon could only gape with wonder. Nothing had prepared him for this. It seemed impossible that Trondheim had been built by mortal beings. The city mountain changed everything he had seen in the Empire. He doubted if even Urubain could match the wealth and grandeur displayed here. Trondheim was a stunning monument to the dwarves' power 
and perseverance. The bold man walked in front of Safira and said, You must go on foot from here. There was scattered booing from the crowd as he spoke. A dwarf took Tornak and Snowfire away. Aragorn dismounted Safira, but stayed by her side as the bold man led them across the carnelian floor and to the right-hand hallway. They followed it for several hundred feet, then entered a smaller corridor. Their guards remained despite the cramped space. After four sharp turns, they came to a massive cedar door, stained black with age. The bald man pulled it open and conducted everyone but the guards inside. <laughs>